Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel's Attorney General has a plan for the residents of Amona, Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman sends a harsh message to terrorists, and Israel's Shas party tries to roll back on mixed gender prayer at the Western Wall. I'm Aaron Porras here with the latest news in Israel. Israel's Attorney General has submitted a legal opinion offering a temporary solution for the residents of Amona, whose houses are slated for demolition by December 25th. The legal opinion of Avichai Mandelblit has the residents of Amona temporarily moving to the three plots located north of the community to land legally defined as absentee property. Absentee property is that which originally belonged to individuals who fled to the territories of a hostile nation during the 1948 War of Independence. A 1998 legal opinion ruled that absentee property may be used under circumstances of urgent public need, and that the solution is for a period of about eight months. Mandelblit said that the temporary solution will only be valid until the Knesset passes the regulation law, at which point the situation will no longer be considered urgent. At that point, the defense ministry would be required to immediately vacate the plots once again. According to the Israeli Supreme Court, there's less than a month to go until the Amona settlement outpost must be evacuated. But elements in the Knesset and the cabinet are working feverishly to create a law which would bypass the Supreme Court ruling and allow the residents of Amona to remain. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz discussed the issue with Jerusalem Post International editor Liat Collins, who said that the implications of bypassing the rule of law are huge. I hope we don't reach the levels of violence again. It's it's. A very problematic I issue. It's also it's heartbreaking for people who've been there, who, who generally see this as their their home and didn't realize that the, there was any um, legal problem with it in the background. Um, so it's it's not a it's not an easy issue. But we have the Supreme Court ruling time and time again, and now setting a final date. December 25th, they must be gone. Do you think that the government will honor that, or do you think that the cabin, the, the Knesset, um, with cabinet approval, will back legislation that will, in effect, go around the high court ruling? It's difficult to say what's going to be in that sense, uh, and the implications are, are huge in, on both, both directions, really, because on the one hand, if you find this loophole that allows the owner to carry on, then you are really finding this loophole that allows all the settlements, including illegal outposts, to go through and, and really, literally make a, uh, a statement on the ground. Um, and if you enforce it on the other hand, then you, you're making a statement also, for example, for uh, illegal Bedouin uh, settlements in the, in the neighborhood, which we're seeing today is also a, a big issue. I mean, how how can you say you can only enforce it against illegal Jewish settlements and not against uh, an illegal Bedouin settlement? So the implications are kind of huge in both directions. And what that law is saying, you know, you and I both, I'm sure, uh, uh, defend Israel in, in public forums uh, when we're abroad and we speak about Israel, the democracy and so on. Here is a case where we would be taking privately owned Arab land and basically handing it over to Jewish uh, uh, residents and, and giving it to them instead. This is not to build a public road. This is not to build an army base. This is so that civil Jewish civilians can live on private land that belongs to Palestinians. True, but I mean, there is compensation being offered. It's not uh, out in that theft, something being taken away and no compensation being given. There's, compensation, there's, yes, but certainly the people would be going against their will, and it's not as though this is for the public good. This is uh, not, you know, to improve uh, the road network or the security of the area. This is to just allow um, Jewish homes. Again, that's, that's one of the problematic aspects, and I think another of them is the fact that uh, the uh, High Court, the Supreme Court, has always stood as as a sort of barrier between us and uh, outside uh, demands from the point of view of international law. They knew that we obeyed this our own Supreme Court and our own High Court of Justice, 
and that their rulings are very fair, their rulings are, are, uh, stand within the parameters of, of international law. And I think the minute the, the, the Knesset or the Parliament goes around that and makes, uh, bypasses the Supreme Court, we're, we're opening up uh, a can of worms from that point of view. It's going to be much harder to say that we're, we act according to the rule of law in accordance with international law also. So let me ask you this. Finally, as a veteran journalist and observer of the Israeli scene, on December 26th, will Amona still be standing? I wouldn't like to make that prediction one way or the other. I can just hope that whatever solution uh, is reached, that it's reached peacefully and fairly. Liat Collins, Jerusalem Post International Edition Editor, thanks so much for being with us at ILTV. Thanks for having me. Speaking after the last week of events, Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman warned that terrorist provocations against the Jewish state will not be tolerated, but met with swift, unilateral, and full-force retaliation. Lieberman made it clear that the military will hit back hard against any attacks, whether they come from Gaza, Syria, or Lebanon. He spoke with specific regard to the first clashes between IDF soldiers and Islamic State terrorists in the Golan earlier this week. ISIS operatives opened fire on the Israeli troops, prompting the Air Force to launch a strike, killing all four terrorists. The defense chief said Israel's response was appropriate. Since the civil war in Syria broke out in 2011, the Jewish state has been hit by numerous mortar shells in spillover violence. But this was the first direct assault. Lieberman is stressing that when attacked on its sovereign territory, Israel has no need to coordinate with other countries fighting in Syria, and will retaliate immediately. He is emphasizing that while the Jewish state is not looking for a fight, any terrorist activity against Israel will be delivered a powerful blow. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu later repeated that Israel will not permit any Islamic extremist groups to open a new front on the nation's borders. Mutual fears over Iran are among the interests shared between Israel and many Sunni Muslim nations in the region. In another sign of developing ties, the spokesman of the Israeli army just granted an exclusive interview to a leading Saudi newspaper. Brigadier General Moti Almoz first addressed the recent clash with ISIS affiliates in Syria. He said Israeli military commanders don't believe the operation indicates a larger change in strategy by the terror group, but may have been launched as a means to assess Israeli preparedness. He added that the defense establishment thinks it was deliberately carried out on a Sunday, when little routine IDF military action takes place. Almoz is the latest Israeli official to speak to the London-based Elaf newspaper, which is owned by a Saudi Arabian businessman. The Israeli general went on to say that Israel's three conflicts with Hamas within a five-year period demonstrates the full extent of the IDF's capabilities, which should deter other terrorists. Turning then to Iran, Almoz said that there has been no change in the hardline Islamist republic's behavior since last year's nuclear deal was signed. He added that Jerusalem is very aware that Tehran's objective to dominate the region as a state sponsor of terror remains unaltered. Riyadh also views Iran as a major regional threat, and Saudi Arabia was one of several Sunni states to originally join Israel in opposition to the international agreement. The ultra-Orthodox party Shas has just proposed a bill that would block the mixed prayer area for conservative and reformed Jews at the Western Wall, which is slated to be built just south of the existing prayer areas. The mixed prayer area at the southern part of the Western Wall has already been approved by the government, but now the Shas initiative aims to have the area declared as a sacred site under the jurisdiction of the chief rabbinate which would give authority to the ultra-Orthodox establishment to decide on the modes of prayer that would be deemed acceptable. If approved, a 10,000 shekel fine would be given to those engaging in male-female mixed prayer, women putting on tefillin, or wrapping themselves in the traditional prayer shawl. Shas leader Arya Deri drafted a proposal for the bill last week, and is looking to gain support from coalition members to present it as a government-sponsored bill. It will almost certainly be opposed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Education Minister Naftali Bennett, however, who backed the original 2015 compromise. Today on the topic of religious identity in Israel, I have the pleasure of sitting with Rabbi David Stav, Chief Rabbi of the city of Shoham and the Chairman of the Tsoha Organization. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm very happy to be here. Pleasure for me to talk to you. So, uh, for those of us who, don't, who are not familiar with the Tzohar organization, can you speak a little bit about what that is? 
So is a rabbinic organization that was established 20 years ago in order to try to bridge gap between societies, especially between observant and non-observant people. Our concern is to keep the, and to preserve the unity and the uniqueness of Israel as a Jewish state and one united state. So I'd actually like to touch upon that a little bit later, but first of all, if the Tzohar movement is founded on halachic Jewish law and orthodox you know, practices, how does it attract people who aren't necessarily you know, attracted to orthodox practices? How, like, where do you get these people who come to you? The vast majority of the Israeli society, although it's not observant in the orthodox meaning of being observant, but yet they want to be inspired by Jewish sources, they want to be inspired by Jewish narratives, and when we expose them to Judaism in a way that uh, is relevant to them and resonates to them, and we perform the weddings for them in a way that they feel that they could ask questions and they are answered in a proper way, and they meet rabbis in their homes and bright counselors in their home, and they feel that they are welcomed and embraced, I think the vast majority of the, of the Israeli society loves it, and uh, uh, it vote, they vote in the, in the foot. I mean, they, ke they keep on coming to us. So I get that, you know, that kind of brings me to my next question is like, the Tzohar organization is essentially working opposite the rabbinic council, the chief rabbinate in, in the country. So, you know, why is that necessary? What's wrong with the chief rabbinate? I think that monopoly, wherever it exists, even if among government offices, um, is a precise recipe for bureaucracy and sometimes for corruption. Now, when it comes to income tax or to other services that the government has to provide, okay, so we have no other choice. But when it comes to religious services and the secular people feel that uh, they don't get the right treatment, uh, we have to create a kind of um, competition within the system. Within the system. So, so, for instance, myself, I am the chief rabbi of the city of Shoham, and it's, a, I mean, it's an official position mm -hmm. on one hand. On the second hand, we challenge the system by encouraging the couples to come to Shoham versus other cities because we show them that we have a better way to, to treat them time is time and our rabbis don't charge money when it's, it's not uh, legal and it's not uh, permitted, etc., etc. And people uh, come and feel that uh, that's the place that uh, they're inspired by. So, you know, is there, is there enough competition, would you say? Or, you know, with, with, between Tzohar and the chief rabbinate and I don't even know how many other, uh, other organizations. I, I think that uh, today the competition is between the local rabbinates themselves. The fact that the, the rabbinate of Ramat Gan and uh, Yerushalayim and Tel Aviv and others try to advertise and to, uh, uh, to invite couples to come to them and tell them that they will be uh, not, not less nice than in Tzohar, this shows that we achieved our, our goal. But yet we, have, we keep on growing, we keep on uh, expanding our activities. As a matter of fact, we have already more than 5,000 couples that wow. have registered to us, which is more than 25% of the secular society that gets married in Israel. I believe that the competition is necessary, is necessary and I believe that uh, the competition will prove it. Will, will prove it. That's incredible. So, uh, all right, so moving on to some current events. I'm sure that you're familiar with, with the current bill that's being pushed uh, against the egalitarian prayer space at the Western Wall. So my question for you is twofold. First, um, the bill to pass to create the egalitarian space was passed nearly a year ago, and it was never even begun. So, you know, how how can you, the Knesset ignore the will of the people? Look, it's not a question for me because it's a question for politicians. But I but uh, I would say the following: the structure of the coalition in Israel is built in a way that 10 or 15 percent that care about something, and that's the most important thing that they care about. Uh, they will have the right to decide who will be the prime minister, and the prime right. minister will, will has no other choice but to uh, give up to them. Now, if you ask me, uh, in principle, what do I think about any kind of legislation regarding the whaling? Well, I believe that any religious legislation is not is not um, good for the for the health of the Israeli society, and I believe that everything has to be achieved by dialogue and by and by uh, agreement with all sides, with all partners that uh, should sit around the table. I believe that if people want to find a solution from all sides, it mm -hmm. could have been found already a long time ago. So that kind of brings me to the, to the second part of my question. You know, without even trying to enact the first bill, there is now being a bill pushed to block it and to even fine 
you know, mixed gender prayer and, and fine women who wear talit or, or uh, put tefillin, you know, isn't that legalizing sexism and discrimination? I think it, 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 this uh, bill has a bigger problem than uh, what you mentioned. I think the fact that somebody tries to coerce people to behave in religious customs that he believes and to cancel and to fine and to punish if somebody behaves in a different way it's against all the fundamental, uh, fundamental principles of a democratic society. I think it's unheard of that somebody that will do something that I don't agree with. But the fact that I don't agree with this behavior will cause him to be punished or to be fined. It's not reasonable. I don't believe that besides uh, uh, gaining some points, political points among his uh, voters, that this uh, bill is going to pass. I, I don't believe there is any chance for that. So, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, I have a follow-up for that. You know, if you touched upon that it's, um, that you don't believe that that's fair in a democratic society, do you think that it's okay from a Jewish point of view? Look, it's fair that Jewish people will debate about Jewish issues. I mean, did you ever see, uh, meet uh, two Jews that agree with them between themselves? It's, every debate is legitimate. What is not legitimate is the fact that people will try to coerce their perception and their theology on others and to find them and to punish them and to sentence them. I think that the entire problem was began with the fact that people put a woman that wore a talit, put them in jail. This was something that was not reasonable. Even if you don't agree with this behavior, but that's not the place, to, that's not the way you treat this, uh, this kind of problems. So, okay, so then my final question is, what is the solution in your eyes? How, how can Israel remain a Jewish state while maintaining its democratic voice for the people? I believe that uh, democracy has weaknesses and advantages. And um, Israel works as a democratic state, but it has to understand that uh, the Jews all over the world feel themselves as a part of the Jewish state. And although they don't want to vote in the Knesset to the elections, but yet their voice should be heard and there should be kind of a dialogue between the Jews in the diaspora and the Jews here, the secular and observant Jews here, in order to see how we find solutions in the Kotel, in the Welling Wall, in the other places. I think that the Welling Wall is only symptomatic for something which is uh, touching mm -hmm. a very sensitive nerve in the Jewish society mm -hmm. all over the world. But yet it's only symptomatic to bigger problems that we have to solve how we uh, treat a society, a diverse society that has so many beliefs. How do we live together? And that's the challenge for this uh, society, for this government. Okay. Well, I, I really, truly hope that we can figure that out, uh, you know, because it puts us all in danger of, you know, it, it really does put us in danger of discriminatory practices where, where the religious practice says, okay, this is the right way to pray and nothing else is, is fundamentally okay. I think that I understand the, the point. I would use religious coercion in very, very rare opportunities, such as the, the law of marriage and divorce, that this by itself actually uh, cancels the possibility of other denominations to perform weddings here. But there's a difference between something that I believe that preserve the Jewish unity and preserves us as one nation, which I could understand the legitimacy of this bill, and other decisions that uh, do not give any kind of legitimacy to people that have different beliefs, whether they are secular, whether they are uh, conservative or reform. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me to just be divisive for the sake of being divisive. Um, anyway, so thank you so much for coming in. I truly appreciate it. And you're welcome. Um, I hope you're right about the bill failing, personally. And all right, thank you. You're welcome. A $1 billion deal has just been inked in the world of business for the acquisition of an Israeli medical device company by the Edwards Life Sciences Corporation in the U.S. The American medical equipment giant has agreed to pay $340 million for Valtech Cardio LTD, which created an advanced system to repair heart valves. The special technique combines a reconstruction implant with a transcatheter approach through the femoral vein that is uniquely adapted to meet the needs of each patient, and the Israeli technology has already been approved in Europe. According to terms of the deal, Edwards Life Sciences retains the right to make up to $350 million in milestone payments over the next 10 years, and then another $300 million for the Israeli company's early-stage valve replacement technology program. 
And that's a pretty fantastic achievement for Valtech, which was only founded earlier this year. The chairman and CEO of Edwards says his corporation believes that the addition of the Israeli company's talented team and technologies will present even more opportunities to help those who suffer from heart valve disease. The Israeli fire department has now officially declared that the week-long fire emergency is over. Firefighters have returned to their normal work schedules after working around the clock as infernos raged across the country. Hundreds of homes were destroyed, thousands of people have been displaced, some 7,500 acres of forest area were destroyed, and 25 of the fires are being investigated as arson. Reporting specifically on the fires in Haifa and their impact on the community, the Times of Israel produced the following video. It was an awful, um, a lot of awful moments um, when I was watching the news and seeing Haifa be, you know, being set up in flames and even seeing my father who grew up here in Haifa and anyone from, you know, from my family, uh, seeing their reaction and how sad they were um, and disgusted by the people who, you know, dared to even think about burning Haifa. You could just understand the love that people have to this city. What we have here in Haifa is respect between the residents, uh, the citizens, whether it's, you know, whether it be Jews, Arab, like Muslims, um, Christians, Druze, you name it, Baha'is, okay? Uh, <laughs> we have all those in Haifa. We put respect before tolerance, you know? Um, a lot of people say, oh, we need to have tolerance and so on. No, I think it's respect. Um, you know, I can tolerate someone, but I'm not necessarily respecting them or hearing their opinion. For us, it, it's, it has no, you know, influence, if, whether it's a terror attack or caused by nature. You know, the minute after you stop the, all the evacuations and you have time to stop for a second, drink coffee and start to realize what happened, then you're flooded with anger and, you know, you're, you're upset. And if you talk about the future, Haifa is a strong city. We have a very strong relationship with all the communities. And I believe it will stay strong. Is it possible that someone from Haifa was responsible? I am not in a place to say if it's possible or not. It's actually regard it's it's not that important from my point of view if it was or not. What is problematic about it is to take these allegations and start using them without any evidence in any way. It's not the important question. The important question is how the government and how the leadership of the government dealt with a theoretical question of that it's possible and change it into a fact. I heard in the news uh, that there is fire in my neighborhood, Romema and I uh, took the car from work and came here to try to save some things and to prepare the house in case fire will get inside the house and then I saw that it's coming and uh, there are workers here because we are under construction of the building uh, renovating the building and uh, I, I saw the fire coming and I told the, the workers here go, go away because the fire is coming and they consist they consist to stay here and to help me. And I really, really appreciate the, the help of the Palestinian workers that uh, worked here on Thursday and helped us to uh, defend this, uh, this house, this building. The, the, the fire, the, the physical fire, we, we dealt with it. Now we should need to deal with the uh, fire of hate, which uh, some politicians are trying to grow here. My name is Joseph. I'm the neighbor of Gilad. We live in the same building, Salafim 6. My kindergarten, uh, uh, where my babies were, the kindergarten is somewhere there, was burned to the ground. It's a kindergarten. There are kids there. When you burn something, you don't know where it's going to hit. I do think it ca they came from the Muslim population. The, the people who manage those communities need to calm down, to understand that, that what they say, there is an act behind it and the act might be very severe, 
like burning a city. Tomorrow they uh, burn something else. I think it's the same case what happened with the kid in, uh, in uh, Duma, the, the kid from the, uh, the uh, east of Jerusalem. It came, some, somebody idiot or stupid did the act, but somebody from behind said something that made him to do that. And if we not stop here, the, this country will burn to the, to the ground because, because there is no end to that. Masa Israel is home to the widest variety of immersive international experiences for Jewish young adults 18 to 30. Find the right study abroad internship, service learning, or Jewish studies program to help you grow as a person, a professional, and a leader, while also developing a robust global professional network that includes Israelis and Jews from around the world. And now for the Hebrew word of the day. Living in Israel, there is never a dull moment, for better or for worse. In Tel Aviv, for example, there is always some art gallery exhibit or restaurant opening or some other possible happening. So today's word is erua, meaning event. Coming from the root letters alef reish ein, meaning occurrence, in erua can refer to any sort of event where people gather. A wedding, a house party, a musical performance, and even a government congregation are all considered eruim, or events. So get onto social media, contact your friends, and make sure you're not missing out on life because there's always an Eruah around the corner. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. ILTV's weather forecast is sponsored by Adopt a Safta, taking care of Israel's lonely Holocaust survivors. Tonight will be partly cloudy with a chance of light rain and a low of 60 or 16 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect the sky to be mostly cloudy with an additional drop in temperatures to a high of 68 or 20 degrees Celsius. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.84 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. Thanks for watching and see you tonight.